Welcome back to a lifetime of Mafia Tales. Today, me and Sal talk about a new series we're going to be covering. Sal went to Lewisburg Prison in 1974. He met all kinds of different mobsters from all kinds of different crime families. In today's video, we talk about how Sal got into prison and who he ran into. We mainly covered the three mobsters that were running a cell block named Mafia Row. Their names were Johnny Dio, Polly Vario, and Joe Armone. Joe Armone was an underboss for the Gambino family at one time, and then Polly Vario and Johnny Dio were both in the Lucchese family. Sal was introduced to these men by none other than Angelo Ruggiero. Please subscribe to our Patreon channel if you want to get more exclusive videos from me and Sal. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to get the rest of our videos. Good morning, Sal. Hey, good morning. Nice day. Good day to talk about historical prison time. Yeah, and in, in fact, we're going to be talking about your experience in Lewisburg in 1974 and all these different mafia guys that were there and what it was like, you know, what life was like and how you had prison guards on the payroll and all sorts of different things. I mean, it, it's it's really insane what the stories are back then and how you, how the mafia ran the prison. You know, they were prisoners, but they also yeah. had a lot of, you know, guards on their payroll and stuff. So. Right. Right. Take um, us back to that, you know, 1974. I mean, even I, before you got bust, or when you got bust, I suppose. Well, I got convicted in uh, early 74, maybe February or March. And I was, you know, in the street doing a lot of things, hanging out with Cataldo and the Colombo guys. And then I was deeply entrenched with Gotti and Angelo and Foxy. You know, that, that was the group. And, you know, every day we were at the, uh, the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. This is before anybody even knew who John Gotti was. Remember, these guys were waiting for the books to open up, become made members. So I get sent off to uh, to Lewisburg. I had gotten 20, 20 years on a bank robbery charge. And I had to be there six months. And then after the six months, they bring me back to Brooklyn and resentence me. So I had no clue on what was going to happen. I had no clue what prison was like you know, what it was really all about. And I got there, and uh, I believe it was the first week of July. Uh, they, they put you down in the hole for like a couple of days, and then they uh, get you out of there, put you in a, a block they called A block. That was sort of like the transition block, that prison block where you had just got there. And or the, also that block was used for people that were coming in and out of Lewisburg. Because in those days, they'd put you on a bus in, in, in New York City. And it's about four hours up to Lewisburg. And you'd get there. And uh, if you were going to be des the destination of being Lewisburg, then you'd stay there. But many guys would come through there just on a trip. You know, like Jimmy Burke would come through there to go to Atlanta prison and, and other prisons. Guys would always come through that way. But when I got there... Uh, I remember going down to the basement and they have to give you clothes and they have to give you a towel and they have to give you all this stuff that you, you know, you need to survive there. And when I got downstairs, there was a line of a few other guys that had just got through there. And I saw Paul Ivario down there. He worked in the, uh, in the, in the uh, prison laundry and, you know, the laundry was there. And also there was, you know, where they had all the the clothing and everything you needed. They gave you shoes and usually army army fatigues. And also, I was introduced to, to the former mayor of Newark. The guy was named Hugh Adonizio, and he was involved with the mob in Newark. And he got caught, you know, bribery and stuff like that. And he was there. And everybody had a big old smile on their face. It was like this was a you were doing prison time, but it was sort of like a joke. They considered it like vacation. <laughs> and then I, you know, kept meeting all these other guys. Well, it wasn't long before I were, I made my way up to, to the, uh, the block. I believe it was at that point. I want to say it was G block or J block. I just don't remember the, the letter, but it was all the Italian guys in that block. And there was some rooms up there, four man rooms. And that's when I got up to see Paul Vario. Johnny Dio, Joe Piney, Joe Amon, and Angelo was in that room. Well, those three guys were made guys, and they 
immediately, uh, you know, embraced having Angelo there because Angelo had a rep. Oh, At yeah. that time, his reputation was uh, he was the nephew of, of Delacroix, Neil Delacroix, and he also was the guy that, you know, was arrested for the murder of McBratney. Yeah. Him and Gotti had pulled off that McBratney murder the year before in 73. But Angelo was there on a different case, like a hijacking case. And in those days, you know, the government usually combined your sentence with, with you know, with the, if you had a state sentence, usually you'd go to the federal government and you'd do both sentences at the same time. So that's where I saw Angelo. We were friends on the street. You know, I was always hijacking stuff. And I immediately recognized the pecking order there. The pecking order was like, okay, I noticed Johnny Dio was the oldest guy. He was like in his 60s. Mm-hmm. And uh, him and Paul Vario were the same family, Lucchese family. Yeah. <clears throat> and then there was that Joe Armone, who had been, you know, a made guy in the Gambinos. I don't know how long he was there, but he was there. He was sort of a quiet guy. And then Angelo, you know, he kind of buddied up with Joe Armone because right. he was a Gambino guy. Yeah. So those were the four guys that were in that room. Now, in and out, as I would be trucking around there, you know, up and down, it was the second floor, I saw Henry Hill there. And Henry uh, always looked like like he was had a big stomach, but he didn't have a big stomach. He worked in the butcher shop, and he was stealing all the fine cuts of meat. And and then Paul Ivario, he had what you called uh, um, like a little hot plate set up, like wire that was like a spring, and he could plug it in, and he could cook steaks, chops, whatever. And then the, the priest, Father John, he was always up there every day bringing stuff in because he'd leave the prison at night and come back the next day. And what I didn't know was the only way you were going to get special treatment was you had to send money to a post office box. I don't know how far away, 40, 50 miles away. And the priest would pick up the postal money order. You'd have your wife mail it. And that would get you get you in with the group and you get the best food. You could have booze if you wanted booze. There'd be all kinds of perks that you could get by sending the priest money. And uh, Johnny Dio was sort of a loud, loquacious guy. He was really loud. Paulie, Paulie wasn't loud. Paulie was only interested in his scotch and making food. He was pretty good. And as you walked into that that cell block, even going up the steps, you could pick up the scent of garlic and onions. You could smell it. Yeah, you could smell everything. They were cooking. You'd go in there, you'd, you know, if you were a sort of accepted guy in there, you'd hit the door like twice. You'd go like, like that. <laughs> and then if uh, guys wanted to come in there and they weren't well known, then they'd be knocking three or four times. But if you, you had the code, the two knocks, in you came. Occasionally I'd go in there and I'd see, you know, like a lieutenant prison guard there. And he had a big box. It was like a lunchbox, a black lunchbox. It was kind of bigger. In the average box, you know, it had a thermos in there, had food in there, and he would stuff that with with things he was going to give Paulie Vario because Paulie Vario and Johnny Dio they paid him off, so he he would bring certain items in there, pepperonis, salamis, cheese. I mean, we had all the stuff that you could imagine in, in Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary, and that, oh. that's the way it was. Well, you know, to give a little background as well is for, you know, these three characters that you want to go into today and well, just to give an understanding on why they had such power in there, because, you know, on the street, these guys were very well connected in the, you know, in the families. So like, right. you know, Paul Mario, he was a Lucchese Capo, right? I mean, real old timer, man. He was uh, born in 1914. And I mean, he had a criminal record. Not a whole lot. I mean, he stayed low key, but like, you know, when he was 11, I know he got arrested for uh, truancy, you know, for school and stuff. And then he would eventually go on to bookmaking, loan sharking, bribery, 
he also had some le- legitimate businesses as well, like right. a flower shop, the cab stand, pizza shop. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the, re- the whole reason a lot of people know anything about him is because of Henry Hill. If we didn't have Henry right. Hill stuff, they wouldn't have nothing. On yeah, Paul. the Henry Hill story, Goodfellas. Yeah. But you know, the other guys were all about the same age. Yeah. I think Johnny Dio, maybe he might, he was born around the same time. I think him or. Yeah, 1914 is when yeah. he was yeah. born. So and, he was already 60 years old when I met him. Yeah. But, but he had a lot of power because. They realized that the Italians kept everything in line there. They kept the blacks away from the whites. They kept, there was some Colombians there. There was some Hispanics there. And nobody messed with the Italians in the in that block. And they called it, you know, Mafia Row. That's what it was. Yeah, and, and they did call you got it. Away, you got away with a lot if you were Italian there. Yeah, you know, even with... Um... Johnny Dio. I mean, there's quite a few stuff on on what he was. I mean, he was 16 years old when his father had died from a mafia related hit. His uncle was involved with the mafia. That was really his end. His uncle's name was uh, Jimmy Doyle, also known right. as James Doyle. Right. Right. And his brothers were Thomas and Frank, and they were both in the Lucchese family as well. Uh, Johnny <clears throat> Dio's brothers, but. Right. You know, like like you said, when we before we went on, he was really connected with Jimmy Hoffa. I mean, it, what right. I read was that he helped promote the whole, uh, you know, help him win the election. I mean, what right. did he? And what were your, your insight to that? Well, I didn't hear a lot of that, but you know, the rumor was, yeah, he was. Um, I mean, Hoffa had just left there. Remember, Hoffa had gotten a presidential pardon. I believe it was like. New Year's Day in 72. So at the time, you know, Hoffa was there. Frank, uh, Jimmy, I mean, Johnny Dio was there. Uh, also at the same time, Whitey Bulger was there. They were all there together. Gotti was there. So there was sort of like this fraternity, okay? But remember now, there was no new, be- new made members in 72. And after Gotti and Angelo killed that guy up in you know, Staten Island, McBratney, then they had sort of a rep, and they were fully embraced by old mob guys. It was like a heroic thing they did for yeah. Carlo Gambino, you know, avenging the death of, of uh, Manny Gambino. So they already had a reputation. Uh, people knew that they were going to start opening the books and making guys. So Angelo was well-received, and uh, he was... He was not exactly what I would call a hundred watt bulb. (laughs) Well, you know, it's kind of weird that uh, even with Johnny Dio and uh, uh, Pauly Vario, I mean, these guys were made in their late 40s, 50 years old. You know, they didn't make guys so young. Like when, I mean, like Gandhi and them, how old did you think they were when they were made? 30s? Well, so, uh, you know, they. The guys were dying off. The old guys were dying off. They needed new members. Yeah. Um, and also the, the, the mob was facing the extinction of organized gambling um, because, you know, in the country, Lotto was starting to get get popular. And, and you know, the gambling part was out. And then, you know, the, the, the crime that most of the mob was involved with was the union shakedowns extortion and all that at the same time in the early, late 60s early 70s the young guys like us the guys that were like 25 or 30 many of them were dealing drugs and so they had come across a lot of money and that money that the what that the uh, young guys were making they would pass it up to the wise guys so they could get proposed for membership so yeah. everything was changing and quickly it was right after vietnam and a lot of guys were selling drugs of course it was all undercover yeah, and Joe Piney that you were in there with, well, one of the three guys we're talking about today, he uh, he was actually convicted on selling drugs and stuff. This guy was an old school uh, Gambino as well. I mean, he was right, right. born in, uh, in 1917, and he, uh, you know, in his early life, I mean, even his brother Stephen, Stephen Armone, they were both involved with right. dealing drugs, heroin, and. So this is where Joe got in with the whole selling drugs, getting right. involved with the mafia. But I mean, he was an old timer doing it. But you know, he was just in the Gambino family. Paul Castellano didn't like that, but he uh, 
Yeah, he still made him a capo in the family. That Joe yeah, Armand. And, and then you know, don't forget this was seventy four, and it was uh, gosh, it was 11, 12 years, eleven years before Gotti made the move on on Castellano. So in those ten years, you know, of course Gotti had gotten out in seventy two, uh, and came to the Sinatra Club, and he was making a name for himself. But at the same time, what he was doing, he was building an army. He had followers. I mean, he was like the Pied Piper in the mob. People followed him. He was a good talker. You know, he didn't do the dirty work. He had people do dirty work for him. And guys like Angelo, who, uh, you know, he was a half a bubble off Angelo. He would do whatever John told him to do. But he was dangerous, Angelo, because he wasn't smart. I mean, he was really what you would have called back in the day a dumb fella. He was dumb, you know, really dumb. Uh, you know, he, he couldn't walk and chew gum, but he was violent and uh, he was a good talker. He would threaten people. And that was his um, that was his personality, what he did. But nobody knew that he was cozying up to Armon and Armon was right underneath Gambino at the time. Remember, um, Carlo Gambino was still alive in 74 after uh, John Gotti and Angelo uh, murdered that guy up in Staten Island, McBratney. They were looked upon by the old man, Carlo Gambino, as the youngest, toughest guys coming up in the Gambino family. Of course, it was two years later that Gambino died and Castellano took over. So, well, so the Gotti was stuck with Castellano. And I wanted to add into that as well was that Gotti obviously had to get Joe Ramon's permission when going after to take Paul out because you think about – okay, if all the other families aren't on board with it, they're going to have to get at least the inside permission from the Gambino family, all the capos to be in line. So he had to have somewhat, you know, may have turned the other way or said yes, but, you know, maybe he had Angelo help him approach him on this matter because they were close in prison. I don't, you know, just. Well, their, their biggest supporter, their advocate was uh, Neil Delacroix, who was an old time mobster, a hitman and all, and he was inside the family at the top. So Angelo had this sort of godfather, you know, protecting him. And that was, in, uh, of course, that was in the early 70s. I remember Delacroix coming to the Bergen, maybe in the summer of 73. And it was interesting. Uh, he got to the Bergen and before you know it, they were talking and then they decided to walk to a little restaurant. I think the name of the restaurant was Guatuccio's a couple of blocks away. And so Gotti and Angelo, uh, you know, walked with Delacroix and the Delacroix was in the middle and behind those two was a guy named Joey Scopo who got murdered, you know, years later, he was really uh, um, close with Gotti and then Gene Gotti, they walked and then Foxy and I be behind those two. And we all went to this <laughs> restaurant and had lunch. Because we we all had a reputation at that time, yeah. so it you was know, sort of like the pecking order of the Gambino family. Yeah, and like with okay, so Joe Armone as well is what I read that he became John Gotti's underboss after Frank DeChico was killed, and then right. Sammy the Bull would go on to be the right. the next one after him. Because I think you know a good thing we could segue into is what these guys did to end up in Lewisburg prison. And right. from what I had researched was that, let's see, I see charges for 1987 for Joe Armone. I mean, he that was way past then, but did he, did he tell you what he did? Because I'm trying no, to see. No, they didn't talk about, those guys didn't talk about the type of crime they did. Although occasionally someone would, would, you know, share some of their stories. It wasn't, the old guys weren't there to brag about the crimes they did. I think the young guys, the 30 year olds started talking about all the kind of stuff that they did and all the work they did for the bosses because they were trying to create a personality and a history. Yeah. But, you know, Angelo, he wasn't a guy to talk about what he did to McBratney that in that McBratney killing. Well, I, I mean, Johnny Dio, from what I read, it was that in 1970, he was sentenced to prison uh, for bankruptcy charges, and he got five years. But while he was in there, they kept giving him more charges. So he right. got thirty plus years. So, yeah, he you know. was a you know he was a pump and dump guy with the stock market. He was a Shylock. 
He was, uh, you know, he had guys break arms for the unions. This is the type of stuff he did all his life. And so he had a big reputation, he had a following. I think, I think his sons even followed him into the life. In those yeah. days, that's what the sons and the nephews did. They followed their fathers and uncles into the mob. You know, that like Paul Vario, he had a whole bunch of sons and nephews. They all, yeah, they were all around him, you know. That well, was, was popular then. Well, even Paul Vario, he uh, in the 1970s, he was a member of Joe Colombo's Italian Civil Rights League, and apparently this put him on the the FBI's radar. They seen right. that, and so whatever they got him for, he ended up getting a couple years in prison, three plus years in there, and then that would have been around the whole Lewisburg thing. So whatever right. he did, I'm sure it was just you know the normal racketeering yeah. stuff they got yeah. him for. But yeah, I mean. So, you know, even uh, like Johnny Deal, though, I mean, he was known for doing some allegedly because I don't think he was ever convicted of the acid attack. Right. I mean, yeah, he threw he threw acid in a reporter's face. Yeah. The 1956 a famous, a famous picture of him with a cigarette in his mouth. He was sort of like snarling yeah. at the press and all. But in that room, it was a very relaxed atmosphere. And they had, uh, you know, two tables where they played cards. Uh, some of the guys played gin rummy, but a lot of the guys were playing pinochle in those days. There was a few guys who played an Italian game. You had to know uh, the old-fashioned Italian card game. They called it brisk in those brisk. days. So if you knew this brisk game, you got to play. And it was a slick, pretty game, a pretty slick game, and it was a lot of fun. And you had a partner. And in that game, what, which is interesting about this Italian brisk game, I'll tell you is you were able to give signals to your partner the cards that you had. So sometimes it'd be like a guy in the sideline of a football game, you know, or a baseball coach giving signals, like all these kind of signals. So while you were giving signals to your partner, the other two uh, guys that were playing against you, they were trying to catch your signals. So it was really interesting how creative you could get in prison on a card game, you know. And they had chess, a chess game there. Um, not too many Italian guys were well read. I mean, years later, uh, maybe a year or two later, I met the great Dave Icavetti, who we talked about. And oh, yeah. He was a classy guy. He had a lot of talents and he had a lot of interests. But these guys were really them, those, and these type of guys, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, they're they, old timers, man. Yeah, old timers, yeah. 19. Before 1920, we'll say exactly all, all three of these guys. Yeah. So I mean, you really got to meet them at their their later ages, and with that Joe Armone, uh, what what was said in court too? I don't know if he ever mentioned it to you or you heard about it, but he uh, when he was convicted, he was he was basically getting life, and he uh, I, well, he probably wouldn't have because this was in 1987. So Joe Armone, he was sentenced to prison for RICO charges, you know, right. extortion, bribery, and he was 70 years old. And so he was going to get another 15 years. And yeah. the judge ended up telling him, he said, for your, um, let's see, he said, I will give you one more Christmas with your family if you admit your role in the Gambino family. Yeah. And, and and he wouldn't do it. So no. he ended up dying in uh, yeah. 1992 from natural Yeah, causes. he was a tough old bird. But you got to understand what prison was like then. Remember, in the early 70s, there was no telephones in prison. So uh, the only way, if you had the connection with Johnny Dio, he'd uh, give the priest, you know, an order, take this guy down into your office and give him a phone call. So, and that cost money. You had to send extra money to the priest through the, the, the money order, you know, the postal money order uh, line where your wife would mail a postal money order. So every once in a while, you'll send an extra $50 you got the opportunity to use the the, the priest's phone. <laughs> Damn, and, that's in insane. In those days, they didn't bug that. The no. Phone. And, of course, there was a couple of volunteer girls who came in on Fridays, and they performed all kinds of uh, charitable, you know. Charitable acts. Little charitable acts, yeah, <laughs> if you wanted it. You know, I wasn't interested in those, in those girls. I was only interested in, you know, getting – it was July of 74 and I had just filed an appeal like, uh, you know, maybe in September and I had hired Jerry Shargell who later 
became this famous, uh, you know, defense attorney for Gotti and all. But I had gotten recommended by Jimmy Burke to use Jerry Shargell. He said, this guy's the sharpest attorney in New York. And occasionally uh, he would come visit me. But I did get a U.S. Court of Appeals reversal. And I got out of there, oh, probably like February of 75. By that time, I had made a lot of connections. And I had met interesting guys. But the summer of 74 was pretty amazing what was going on there. We had uh, Fat GG in Galice. And I had a friend who would get his wife to visit him, but he wasn't inside the prison. He was actually outside uh, at the at the Lewisburg farm. And so he was only doing two years. So she would come up and sometimes she'd come with my wife. And her na- his name was Frankie Balsamo. And I would tell my wife, bring a box of cigars, good cigars, and, and give them to Marie. Marie would give them to her husband, Frankie. And Frankie would have two or three cigars in his jacket pocket when he would come in and he'd give me these cigars well one of those cigars was always destined for fat gg lewis and who was <laughs> a funny funny drug dealer and i'd go out in the yard with him we'd sit out there on a bench and uh, you knew my name was ubats he goes ubats oh, you have no idea how important this cigar is to me and he'd he would make love to the cigar he would lick it and hold it. And then I said, come on, tell me. This guy was the greatest storyteller. I don't know. Maybe that's how I learned how to tell stories. He was very descriptive. He had stories about the beginning, the middle, and the end of all his experiences. And he was a big-time gambler. And he would, I'll tell one of those stories online one of these days when we, when we talk about this again. But he was a fanatic New York Yankee fan. And he would always tell me that in the summer of maybe, I guess it was 71 or 72, he used to get shopping bags full of money that black guys would bring him. And he was dealing drugs in Harlem. He was part of the Purple Gang. He was already a legend. And uh, you couldn't talk about time to Fat GG because he had been in New York fighting two or three criminal cases, a RICO case and all. And the government gave him one year because he wouldn't talk at a grand jury. And as that year went by, they gave him 15 more years. Then he had 16 years. And as he was starting to do his time, they pulled him back to New York, convicted him on another RICO charge and gave him 40 more years. So you didn't talk to him about your six or eight, 10 years because he was doing 56 years. And, And he was jolly about it, you know? Of course, after I left in 75, he wound up getting his 40 year sentence thrown out and eventually he got back on the street but this was a happy go lucky guy and he had connections to the entertainment industry he always had great stories he really did and it took me five or ten minutes to tell the story about about him going to yankee stadium but he was a fun guy i met and the best thing about him was he goes zubats i was 20 26 years old or 20 29 years old he's zubats you got to stop stop robbing those banks he said, it's simple. He held up his hands like this. He said, you could make more money with a spoon and a strainer. <laughs> Learn about drugs. Well, he didn't know that I was already involved in that. Yeah. In drugs, you know, and oh, how'd you, oh, yeah. go ahead. I was, uh, I was going to ask you a question after. Go um, ahead. Oh, okay. So one, I mean, with these guys, I mean, how did you get so close with them? How were you able to just start getting on these friendly terms with them? I mean, did they know? I don't know. Angelo probably told a few stories how crazy I was. The the audacious robberies that I pulled off, you mm-hmm. know, the airport robberies. There were already legendary robberies going into the airport and, and taking over a terminal and, and, you know, doing this kind of stuff. I did crazy stuff, you know, hijackings and armed guards and jewelry heists. I did all this kind of stuff with Foxy. And Foxy was still alive in July yeah. of 74. It wasn't until that Christmas that Tommy killed him. But the people I met there, they sort of recognized, recognized me at 29 years old. They figured, oh, this guy's going to be, he's going to be a made guy. He's in, inside with, you know, with the higher ups in the mob and, I had a reputation that that was important. I had been shot by a cop in 71 and that stuff follows you when you do the, those type of things. Yeah, I would imagine so. And with uh, 
What about the okay? So the three main guys we're talking about: Johnny Deal, Joe Armone, and then uh, Paulie. Paulie, yeah. So Paulie, when yeah. you went into that, well, I guess you said Angelo was in there too. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, did Angelo was, or who brought you in there to go and meet with these guys? Well, Angelo um, did because I had just come fresh out of hanging out at the Bergen every day in seventy one, seventy two, seventy three, like that. You know, what so was I was well accepted like? there. You know, being a crazy. A crazy mofo. I mean, that was wacky. I'm telling you. Well, so, how did like, they introduce themselves and all that? I mean, what was it like? Your well, first I knew Paulie from the street. Yeah. Okay. I knew Angelo. So I got introduced to Joe Armone. Nobody said, oh, this is Joe Armone. He's a made guy. No, they didn't say that. They never said that. <laughs> oh, this is Johnny Dio. He's a made guy. You know, Angelo, you know, behind their backs would talk about him. He'd talk yeah. about everybody behind their backs, you know. And, and he was always trying to kiss up to those guys. He really didn't need to because his reputation followed him there after they whacked out that McBratney guy in Staten Island. He become legendary with Gotti. Yeah. You know? But there was a lot, a lot of guys from different families there. Some of the other guys that I got to know was the two guys from Philadelphia. Oh yeah. Uh, that was uh, Rick and Bill Testa, who later went out there and became the. You know, the boss of the Philly mob. And then there was Harry the Hump Riccobini. And those yeah. two guys would play chess all the time. I Were would they sit pretty there close? Watch, I'd watch them. Yeah. I'd learn how to play chess by watching them. And I didn't realize, I thought they were like, you know, buddies. Of course, later on, years later, when they went back to Philadelphia, they became arch rivals trying to kill each other. Of course, Chick and Phil got killed. And then Bruce Springsteen wrote a song about Chicken Field getting <laughs> blown up. I mean, these all these guys became legendary, really. The mob, the you know, the Italians from New York looked down upon Philadelphia. They they looked at the Philly mob guys like they were farmers. The Italians had words for farmers, they'd call them ah, they're famaiolas, farmers. <laughs> Italian, you know. So, so they weren't just you know, though they just looked down because they weren't as big as the New York. Right. But New they York. turned out to be really vicious and violent. They oh, yeah. turned Philadelphia into a bloodbath there. They really did. I mean, and I actually met Chick and Phil Testa's son. His name was Sal. Sal, be in the visiting room. Because you That's always insane. got to meet family in the, in the visiting room when you when you did the visits. Like Henry in Goodfellas, you know, Karen, his wife, would hit pass him stuff. And he'd go into the bathroom, in the visiting room, stick drugs up his ass. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, that, that's how he got the drugs in. Oh you know? hell no! And when man. you went out from the visiting room between the visiting room and the prison, there was this inspection room, and you had to, you know, lift up your arms, open your mouth, bend over, hold your cheeks open. They would look up your butt, but of course they didn't look up the Italian guy's butts, not up <laughs> Henry's butt. He had already stuck stuff up his ass. Oh drugs my to bring God! It in. Of course, he was doing that secretly behind Paulie. But the drugs got him other favors from other guys. And there was badass Colombians there. There was a couple of badass black guys. I remember Angelo telling me about a black guy that was there, a big old muscle-bound black guy who was a known killer. And the mob had a grip on him. And I heard he who had was it? Cut. I don't remember his name. It might have been Wayne or something. But he was killing people in prison for the mob. Damn, man. So he was, yeah, yeah he was like some kind of... Enforce connector. Oh, yeah, he was a enforcer. legendary guy. And in those days, we had other people in that prison that became popular. We didn't realize it. You had the guy who was the subject of Dog Day Afternoon movie. He, was, he was in it, the Dog Day Afternoon robber. He was there. Damn. Robber. Frank yeah, Lucas, too, right? Lucas was in and out. Yeah, Frank Lucas. Yeah. Uh, I got to see how the Italians treated Lucas in New York because when I went back, uh, fighting my case on a on a uh, an appeal issue, they embraced Lucas in in the uh, holding facility MCC. He'd play pinochle with everybody. Frankie DeChico was there because as I left Lewisburg in February the following year, I got to go back to the old West Street House of Detention for a few months, and then they opened up the new uh, Metropolitan Correction. A holding facility but some of the stuff that happened in lewisburg were truly it was truly amazing the following month i had only been there a month and there was this guy there named richard mccoy this guy they don't know they thought he was the real db cooper 
because he had skyjacked the plane and jumped out with a half a million dollars. And he got <laughs> caught, got convicted, and got, I think he got 25, 30 years. But what he did was in the summer of that year, I believe it was the same week that Nixon resigned from the presidency. He drove a garbage truck around the, the institution picking up all the garbage and he drove it through the back gate and disappeared. And he went on a cross country, you know, escape. And eventually he robbed a bank in North Carolina and then the FBI killed him out in North Carolina. <laughs> so they thought he was D.B. Cooper. Till this day, nobody really knows who D.B. Cooper was because the no. way that McCoy or D.B. Cooper, the both, they both skyjacked the plane with a half a million bucks, 400,000 on the plane. And at the same time, you know, you had Hoffa that had just left and Tricky Dick was the president. So we were sitting there the week that Nixon got up and spoke. I think he spoke like the week or two before and said, I am not a crook. Well, it took about two weeks and finally the pressure was on and he, he, he made a national um, appearance and he resigned. And uh, everybody, all the Italians would be walking around the prison. Hey, I'm not a crook. You know, <laughs> everybody would say, I'm not a crook. What are you doing here if you're not a crook? It was a joke because everybody knew Nixon was on the take. Yeah. He was actually on the take with the unions. So there was a lot that went on in Lewisburg. One well, of the funny, one of the funny things that happened in Lewisburg that that summer or that fall was Johnny Dio had this connection with the Lions Club, like you know, a charitable organization. Mm -hmm. And once a month they would bring a movie inside the prison and they would show it like in the cafeteria, they'd put up the screen and show a movie. So I remember one time uh Somebody said, hey, let's go see this movie. It's a great movie. Steve McQueen, you know, he robs a bank in the movie. I didn't know anything about the movie. We go in there and we sit there and watch the movie. And the, it was called the first getaway movie with Steve McQueen and Ali McGraw. <laughs> and at the end of the movie, he gets away. And I always thought, why would the prison allow a movie in front of criminals where the, the two guy, the two people in the movie rob a half a million bucks and they get away. Motivation. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting how, you know, how much influence that Johnny Dio had in that prison. I yeah. don't know if he had the warden, but I know he had the assistant warden because the assistant warden would go up in that room and Paulie would be over there slicing that garlic like he did in Goodfellas and cooking sausage and they didn't. They may believe they didn't see anything or hear anything or smell anything, but the whole scent of Italian culture was in that block. <laughs> culture. It was J block. I believe it was J or G. That's yeah. I, I can't remember whether it was J or G, but I'm sure we'll have some people who are going to call in. They'll say, oh, yeah, J block, where Henry was, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, all these the three guys in particular that we really went into detail today, Johnny Dio, Paul Vario and uh, Joe Armone, they all died in prison. He, all of them. They, they were old and they all, all three of them died from one right. of the research. And, and that's, yeah. And they didn't make it out. So, I mean, years, years later, because they were, they were in and out of the prison many times. So, although Johnny Dio was there the whole time, he was time, the only one. He ever got out. Yeah, he stayed there forever. And then the other guys, they got picked up on other yeah. charges. But yeah, when Joe he, Armone got out, I don't know what year it was. Uh, he cozied up to Gotti. I, it might have been after. I don't know if it was before Gotti whacked out Castellano or not, but he became a Gotti supporter. Oh, yeah, That's he no became moment. the underboss. And then yeah. he yeah. went to Florida is what I re had read in that he uh, got picked up again, you know, like I said, 1987 for the RICO extortion bribery. And what he had tried to do, he tried to get – one of the guys in the family, he was a connected guy that was in prison serving a life sentence. He was trying to get him to better facility. So he was trying to bribe someone. Yeah. Well, he, got, he got in trouble for that. And then he had to go to prison and then for extortion and bribery. Yeah. I mean, that's what yeah, it was. There was some guys that could do that. They made contacts yeah. with the B BOP, the Bureau of Prisons, you know, and they made payoffs. In those days, it was popular. You could make payoffs to government employees you know so yeah to get better uh you know to get to a better prison whatever i mean lewisburg was an interesting place though it was the first time i ever went to prison 
Uh, I never went back there, but I, I always thought that what a great place to tell stories about, you know, the changing mob in the seventies and how it worked. Yeah. So what, one of these days uh, I'll probably write a little bit about that place and who went through there. I, I know there was a husband and wife some years ago who did a documentary on Lewisburg and it was so good. They won an Academy Award. See, there's still interest around it, especially all the history that you were around. Yeah, yeah, so, good, good history, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, once you get out of prison and you go through that, you know, Italian guys look at you, oh, this guy did his time, he's a stand-up guy, you know, because I got out the following year in 75. And you were facing that, 40 years. Back. I'm sorry? And you were facing 40 years, wasn't it, or 20? Yeah, 30, 40 years on bank robbery, gun charge. You got like one that. year. <laughs> yeah, Damn. I, did, I did 13 months and that was it, you know. Uh, but there was a lot happening at that period, you know, because Angelo, I'm trying to think, I got out in 75. I think it was maybe because in those days, a lot of guys got five years for hijacking or something like that. And in those days, they had what they call a B, B number on your sentence. You were allowed to do 20 months and out because you got 60 months, but you only had to do a third of the time. So you do your 20 months and out the door you went. Damn, that's it. <laughs> that Damn. all changed because they had, you know, restructuring the sentencing oh, yeah. guidelines, you know, and they wanted you in and out. And I think, I don't know what it is now. I think you have to do at least half your time. Yeah, yeah. maybe even more than that. Yeah. But a little more probably over that. But I mean, so I, that's what, you know, what I was trying to get at is, you know, these guys, they, they died there. So what can yeah. people learn from these guys is a uh, terrible life. They went down all three of these guys because they ended up dying in prison. I mean, what, what would you say? Well, you know, it was the way of life. The mob was, you know, had this mystique about, about the life and everybody looked up to mobsters, you know, you didn't run around saying, Hey, I'm a made guy. You didn't do that. You know, there was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. <laughs> Look, there was no phones in no. the federal prison. The year I was there, I think it, they started having telephones the following year, like 75 or 6. So, you know, I needed a phone call. And I said to Paul, yeah, I need a phone call. Can you talk to Johnny? And he said, all right, come tomorrow. And then uh, I went in there and Johnny Deal says, hey, we talked to the priest for you. Go down to the priest office at such and such a time. And you get a phone call. That was a big deal. I was able to call my wife. And yeah. Say, and say, make sure you go to give the attorney money, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. And um, I had no clue that years later, I'd get a message that I had to uh, return a favor to that Johnny Dio. And of course, it's in the book. We talked about it. And I had to go do some things that people would not get excited about doing. Yeah. Well, people can hear about it and stuff on another episode that we'll cover. But yeah. and, and even if they've seen all the documentaries and stuff, you know, yeah. people know. But I mean, it's just a, a you know crappy life to go down, really. And when it right. comes down to it, it being spending in prison and life. I mean, Joe Ormone, he didn't get to spend that Christmas with his family. You know, he stayed loyal to his word. I mean, right. none of these guys were cooperators. None right. of them. None of them. So that well, the three that we talked about today. So yeah. they end up spending half their life in prison, man. So yeah, stay yeah, away. Yeah, it, was, it. <laughs> it wasn't uh, you know, it wasn't the image that most people thought about this you know, mafia lifestyle. It's golden, it's glorious, it's glamorous. Not so. And I would tell people, I saw it changing right in front of my eyes and I could see that it wasn't the way to go, you know, for your entire life. It was like, get in and get out. But, uh, you know, any like anything else, it's easy to get into something. But mm -hmm. like getting out, I remember, you know, Faz GG saying, look, we're in a lifestyle. Think about when you get married. You get married in five minutes, you say, I do, and you're supposed to stay married to the woman forever. And he goes, think about how you get out. What's the exit strategy? Oh, you got to get an attorney. You got to go to court. And it was the same with the mob. It was easy to get in. And once you got in, they sucked you in, and they had you by, by the balls, you know, in that life. Yeah, that's true. Well, I think that's a good point to wrap up. So thank you, everybody, for watching. We're going to go over to our Patreon channel now. I know we've been getting a few more subscribers on there, so it's pretty – it's good, man. I, I like the Patreon. We go over there. We share another story. So if anybody wants to subscribe and be part of our exclusive community, and we're going to go over there and talk more about the Lewisburg prison 
go into detail on there. But just stay tuned for the next episode because we're going to be talking about more characters from this Lewisburg prison. There's a there's a lot of characters. That's for damn sure. You got anything right. else, Sal, you want to throw in there before we No, end on but, here? you know, remember my time in federal custody, I spent seven or eight months in Lewisburg. Then I went back to New York while I was fighting my case, and I spent another seven months. And in those seven months, we'll do a little bit more about, about the uh, new MCC. They called it Park Row and oh, how okay. different that holding facility was and who I got close to, which was Dave Icavetti. And Jimmy Burke was there and Tommy D. Simone was there. So that's a whole other episode, what went on in New York in uh, in the summer of 75. Yeah, and that's what we'll be covering. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you on the next one. That wraps up today's story about Sal going to Lewisburg Prison in 1974. We got to talk about the three main characters today that ran the prison block called Mafia Row. We will continue to cover the rest of the characters week after week. We are working on trying to get this story made into a movie. So please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to continue to get more videos from me and Sal. If you want to get more exclusive videos, please subscribe to our Patreon. It's in the video description. Me and Sal go on there and we talk about more topics that we can't cover on YouTube. If you want to support our podcast as well, all these items can be found in the video description. Sal's book, The Sinatra Club, The Sinatra Club Playing Cards, an autographed picture of Sal, and another ticket that was a part of an event that Sal had hosted. Thank you again for watching, and of course, we'll see you on the next one.